the round button on the console. That's what I needed. Okay. So, uh, I, I've been trying to come up with you know, new talks each and every year, and uh, you can only talk about file systems for so many years before you find that you have a room with about three people still in it. So, I figured if I put the word security in the title that somehow that, that would uh, get people to be more interested in, in coming to listen to it. So what this is really is sort of a little, if you will, almost a history of the security of, well, Unix slash BSD slash FreeBSD. Uh, it gets sort of more specific as we go along. So security is a mindset. And what I mean by that really is something that you have to think about from the beginning. Uh, the, uh, the classic example of where it wasn't thought about from the beginning is the early MS-DOS slash Windows systems where the computer was just sort of being used by whoever was sitting at it. There was no notion of logging in or having an identity or isolating different people. Uh, and when they try and glue it in after the fact, it just doesn't ever quite work right. So Unix from the very beginning had a notion of identifying users and using that identity to then have access control of files and to be able to decide how you should be able to manipulate and control processes and should you be, how you should be able to access devices. And uh, this notion of being able to expand privilege, uh, so the set UID and set GID uh, were very, very early basic concepts in Unix. Now obviously we need much more sophisticated things today, but that formed the core of the security model in Unix, and that still carries through 40 years later uh, as one of the, the, the sort of the base pieces that you'll find in any Unix-like system. Now, there's, in sort of modern terminology, something that's called a trusted computing base. And if you will, this is the, you know, what do you have to have just sort of axiomatically uh, in order to be able to build a secure system? And this is really sort of looking at the, 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 the core of that. Uh, so you have, of course, the CPU that you're running on, and it needs to provide certain features like memory management units uh, in order to provide the isolation between processes. Uh, above that, you have your kernel, you have your boot scripts, sort of the core utilities, things like your shell, the thing that controls login, things that can deal with the, the, the core hardware like ifconfig. Uh, and then, of course, all the libraries. So libc obviously is used by these things and some other sort of libraries that are the basis for these utilities. Uh, on top of that, you're going to almost certainly have to have some kind of crypto support. Uh, so this is going to be things like OpenSSH and OpenSSL uh, and IPsec and so on and so forth. Uh, and increasingly, there is hardware that helps uh, speed up cryptography, and so you need to have some access to that crypto hardware, uh, typically by these higher level things. Okay, so let me just sort of give an overview. This is really sort of walking through the expansion of our notion of security over time. Uh, so very early on, back in the 80s, uh, I came up with this thing called immutable and append-only uh, flags. And this is to give you uh, essentially tamp be able to make tamper-proof the, the critical files and logs and so on. Uh, following that, um, we had jails. Uh, we had sort of initially cherooted environments, but they didn't really provide uh, the full capability that we needed. And so jails came along, which at the time were uh, very novel things. Again, this is an idea that you now see in zones and lots of other things uh, in other uh, Unix-like systems. Uh, but it's essentially a lightweight FreeBSD virtual machine. Uh, then along came access control lists, also called ACLs. And this is to give finer grain discretionary access control to files and directories. Uh, we then also got mandatory access controls and the difference between uh, ACLs, which are often referred to as discretionary access controls, uh, that is to say individual users on the system can control them, 
The mandatory access controls are system-wide uh, controls on information flow uh, and on access. And the individual users can't override that. The, that's imposed uh, by the, the, the system that's administrating the machine. Uh, we also have the notion of privilege, uh, if you will, the subdivision of root privileges. Uh, then uh, refinements to the auditing. So rather than simply just keeping track of the commands that were executed, uh, we have much finer grain, or the ability to have much finer grain re uh, accounting and uh, dealing with uh, how those account records are stored and so on. And then the, the sort of the most recent piece that's been added uh, is capsicum. Uh, this allows you to do sandboxing uh, of of process rights, and again, we'll take a little look at that. Um, all of this is going to be sort of high-level, hand-wavy, cursory stuff. Um, Capsicum, in particular, uh, Powell's going to be doing a talk on that, and his entire talk is essentially what work's been going on in this particular area. Uh, so if this interests you, uh, I suggest you go to that talk, which I believe is later today. Okay, so let's just go through. Uh, the first thing that got added was this notion of immutable and append-only flags. Uh, this actually came about because we had brought up the, uh, well, at the time, ARPANET at Berkeley. And up to that point, it had just been you know, people sort of locally logging in. And initially, it was just a few of our friends that would come in. But as the network began to grow, you might find this hard to believe, but there were some characters out there that seemed to have bad intent. And uh, they would try and log into our machine and do bad things, and we didn't like that. Uh, and so we wanted to make it difficult for them to do this. Uh, so we came up with this idea that you could have immutable files. And if you set the flag on the file that says it's immutable, it can't be changed, you can't move it, you can't delete it, it's just there. Uh, and then a slight uh, variation on that is a flag that says it's append only, which has all the properties of immutable except that you can append data to it. Once the data is appended, of course, it, you can't get rid of it. Uh, so think of this for logs. Uh, so you would set this thing up, and for the, there's sort of two sets of these flags. There's the ones that the users can set, and if the, you decide you want to make some change to the file, you just turn off the flag, and then you can, you know, it's not immutable anymore. You can do what you want. Uh, but there's also a set of uh, flags that can only be set by root, and when they're set, they are set-only flags. So the flag itself is immutable. Uh, so it's essentially, you, you know, when you set that flag, it's burned into the iron oxide unless you get your file out to scrape it off. It's not going anywhere. Uh, and, uh, of course, that makes it a little difficult to do system updates. So we came up with this notion of secure levels. Uh, so if you're in secure mode, which is one or two here, then these rules are enforced. And when you're in insecure mode, uh, then you can go ahead and make changes. Uh, so uh, normally, uh, you're in insecure mode when you're running single user. And then when you come up multi-user, uh, you go into secure mode. And the, uh, the idea here is that the administrator can always raise the security level. Uh, so if you're, for example, at level one and you want to go to very secure mode level two, you can do that. But only process one is permitted to lower the level. So unless you replace init, uh, then nobody, including the super user, can bring it down. It's only when init takes the system down to single user that it will lower the secure level. Now, of course, there's all the things, you know, oh, well, I'll just open dev kmem and go find the variable that's listing that and patch it and so on. Uh, so uh, in order to prevent that, dev kmem and dev mem become read-only when you're in secure mode. Well, I'll just go out on the disk and patch the flags. Well, uh, any mounted disk is read-only when you're in secure mode. Uh, you can go to very secure mode, uh, which says you just can't write to any disk device. Uh, so that even if you unmount the file system, uh, you still can't go out and mess around with it. The problem is you also can't do things like NuFS, uh, which is kind of a pain. So you might want this on a gateway, say, where you're not going to be doing sort of active stuff. Uh, but normally, you just run in secure mode. OK, so this all seems like a great idea. Uh, it, it certainly worked for us at Berkeley. You know, the, the hackers would log in, break in, and they'd get root, and they'd start going around, and they couldn't put in a Trojan horse in SH and log in and so on. And then well, they'd at least go and try and cover their steps because they'd see everything they were typing was going into the logs, and they couldn't truncate the logs, and they couldn't move them aside, and they'd flee. And 
didn't come back, and that was fine with us. Um, but the fact of the matter is that when you sort of look at some of the issues with these immutable flags, they start to have some fairly serious problems. Uh, not in terms of the security, per se, but it's things like immutable files can only be updated uh, when the system is single user. And if you're trying to run a 24 by 7 service and you need to update, let's say, uh, SSH because there's some security breach, you have to take the machine down. That's the only way you can replace that binary. Uh, and let's say you like to rotate your logs. You know, that's something that you like to have happen every morning, say 3 in the morning. Well, you can't move them unless you take the system down. And so unless you take the system down every night to rotate your logs, you're kind of stuck with them the way they are. Uh, and then, of course, your direct hardware access is restricted. So if you're, especially if you're running at level two, you can't do NuFS and other sort of things like that. Uh, but the real killer and the thing that really sort of puts the stake through the heart is that all startup activities have to be protected because if you for example, can put something in an RC directory that's going to get run at startup time, then you can put something in there, and then if you just crash the machine, it'll auto-reboot, and as it reboots, it'll run your script, and now, you, since it's running single user when the scripts are run, it can go mess around and do bad stuff. And you'd say, yeah, but you know, we, we, our machines never crash. Yeah, well, go look at the bug reports. There's always an ongoing stream of ways that you can you know, run this script and it crashes the machine. So uh, you just have to assume that uh, people are going to be able to reboot your machine. And what that means is that all startup scripts and all the directories that contain them and all binaries that are used during startup and all libraries that are used during startup and any configuration that's file that's used during startup has to be immutable or you're toast. And so uh, you, know, you end up having to lock down et cetera, which kind of makes it a little inconvenient. And you know, someone decides that they're going to use some crazy you know, Python script or something, and suddenly the whole Python system and its libraries need to be secure. Uh, and so it, it, practically speaking, you, just, you can't get around this very well without uh, making the machine virtually unusable by, for the administrator. So it was a nice idea, uh, but it's pretty much been retired. OK. Moving along, uh, we get jails. And again, I'm just going to give you the, the, the super 20,000 foot view here. Uh, I'm sure that many of you can tell me more about jails than I can tell you. Uh, a lot of the, this jails really is, is getting them set up and running, and there's a lot of scripts uh, these days to help with that process. In fact, there's sort of, uh, let's just say, two competing ways that are thought of to do this, and some folks here at this conference are getting together to try and hash out uh, a, you know, sort of take their ideas and get them together and come up with something uh, that everybody can sort of agree on. Uh, the idea, though, is we got the big box, which is sort of the, the real machine that we're running on, and it has its own bin, dev, et cetera, user, and so on. Uh, and it usually has a jails, a user jails, and then you sort of create the various uh, different jails that you're interested. So this picture shows we have a jail that's going to be doing web services, another one that's going to be doing mail services, and uh, effectively we chirrut down into that, uh, and each of them typically has a complete set of binaries. Now, if you're going to have a single purpose thing, you don't need the whole set of binaries in your web area, and in fact, you probably want to have the absolute minimum, so if somebody manages to get something bad to happen, uh, in your, in your web server, there's not going to be a lot of binaries to help them out uh, that they would have if they were running in a fully populated uh, area. OK, and then we also uh, have this notion of uh, virtual networks so that you get your own network stack. And so all the things that we think of as sort of global variables for the network, timeouts and things like that, um, you can set, and it only affects your network stack. Uh, so here in the, in the real machine, we've got the real network interface, and it's got its network stack. Uh, and then it creates these virtual interfaces, which are sort of, think of them as point-to-point -point links almost. Uh, and so uh, here the, the actual packets come in, and then we choose to forward some of them through this interface to this jail, and we forward some of them through this interface to that jail. 
And so, as far as this jail is concerned, it thinks it's got its own network and it can IF config, but what it's IF configing is this thing. And so, when it puts it into promiscuous mode, what it really is saying is, well, all the packets that come through my interface I want to look at. So, we can still do things like pinging and so on. Uh, but, in fact, we're just working with this. And the host machine is really deciding what are the packets that you get to see. So even though you might try and say, well, I, I want to see all the things coming in for the IP address, which is one of these other jails, the fact of the matter is they're not being forwarded to you, so you won't see them. Uh, and so you know, in this way, we, we get the uh, isolation, but we get the appearance that uh, you know, we're on our own sort of machine. OK. So sort of the rules, if you will, of jails is we want to be able to say, you know, here, here, your root, here's the root password, have a good life. Uh, and in fact, you can't do everything that root could do if you were on the, the, the bare hardware, um, but you can do most of it. So you can decide, uh, you know, what gets to run and how it, you know, what user IDs you have and group IDs and who can signal what and you can change files, you know, I mean, you have the same ability to change permissions on files that root would have on the main system, except, of course, you can only see the files that are in your jail. Uh, you can bind ports to your jail's IP, uh, any of its addresses, and you can set up raw and divert and routing sockets and so on. What you can't do is things that are going to affect other jails or the main machine, so you can't find out about information on things that are running in other jails. So if you do a PS, you do the sys control that says, you know, tell me every, every process running on this machine. In fact, all you're going to get back are the processes that are in your jail. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can't change you know, kernel variables. So you, 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 the sys controls that allow you to say max proc, for example, you can't, you can't mess with that. You can't mount and unmount file systems because that would allow you to reach out and perhaps get to things you shouldn't get to. And you can't modify the, the, the real network interface. Uh, and you're not allowed to reboot, you know, because that sort of tends to affect other things besides just you. Um, but it's, for all intents and purposes, it looks a lot like you have your own machine. And the beauty of this over uh, VMs is that with VMs, they, have, they require a huge amount of resources. And so if you have a really big honking machine, you might be able to run eight or 10 or maybe even 20 VMs, but uh, you, at that point, you just sort of run out of steam. You run out of memory and, and, and things just sort of go south on you. Whereas with jails, although when we originally did them, we had the intent that, oh, you'd run five or 10 of them, um, we fairly quickly discovered that people were going way beyond this. Uh, I remember one report that came in and somebody said that uh, uh, it was taking, you know, packets were taking forever to get to, you know, the, the network kept slowing down uh, when they set up jails. And it's like, well, you know, how many are you setting up? Oh, well, a thousand. It's like, you're doing what? Because, of course, when a packet comes in, we have to decide if it's for, the for this machine. And the way you do that is you say, is this one of our IP addresses? Well, in the old days, we just walked through the list of two or three addresses associated with the interface, and it was yes or no. And now, for every incoming packet, we had to walk through a list of 1,000 IP addresses. Uh, and so obviously, you have to start hashing on this stuff and other things. But you know, today, yes, you can run 1,000 jails. Now, hopefully, they're not trying to do too much, or you're going to get bogged down. But there's, you know, the scaling that's possible is way beyond what you're going to be able to do with a VM. All right. So moving along, we get access control lists. Now, the idea of access control lists is to give us finer grain control over files than we have with the, the traditional uh, user group and other. So, you know, with the, with the traditional Unix, you, you have the read-write-execute for the, the owner of the file and read-write-execute for the group and read-write-execute for everything else. And although you can do some sort of cool things like that, uh, for example, you might have someone that you decide is a pariah, that you don't actually want to be able to have access to this, but you want everybody else to have access. So you can create a pariah group and put that person in it, and then you set the, the, the permission bits to be read, write, a execute for the owner, nothing for the pariah group, and read, write, execute for, for everybody. And you'd say, well, yes, but even though they, are not, they don't get permission based on the group, they'll just get it based on everybody else. 
But in fact, the way Unix does it is it first checks user, and if you, uh, uh, if that, if you, if you know, you're not the owner, then it moves on to the next one. It says, oh, are they in this group? And if you're in that group, then it checks the group. And if it says no to your group, that's it. We don't keep checking after that. And so you can, you know, you can sort of exclude everyone or you know, this one person and let everyone else through that way. But that's still somewhat limited. So the idea with ACLs is that we're going to hang uh, a description which can be much more detailed here. Uh, and so uh, you can say read permission, write permission, execute permission, then look up in the case of directory, which is normally overloaded with the execute bit, but this is actually a separate permission, uh, and then administration. Uh, which again is normally only for the owner of the file, but you can set the administration bit to say, even though you're, this person that's the administrator is not the owner, they can still chmod it and so on. Okay, so then for each of those five per permissions, you can have a list of individuals, you can have a list of groups, and you can still have everybody else. So it, you, know, you can get very fine-grained control uh, Login by login. Okay, now with uh, the, the traditional permissions, you have a UMask, and that's used to decide sort of how to initialize the the permissions uh, on a file. And uh, with ACLs, you typically have something where you can have either what's called a default ACL or an inheritable ACL, which I'll explain on the next slide. And that says if we haven't explicitly set it, then this should be what is given uh, to new files. And uh, then we have some user level commands. So there's get file ACL to essentially tell you what they are and set file ACL uh, to set them. OK, so what are the semantics of ACLs? Well, there's this uh, minor issue, and that is that uh, it's, ACLs are, are one of the least compatible thing between different systems that you will ever have the misfortune to deal with. And the reason for this uh, is, first of all, because when Unix was being standardized back in the days of POSIX, uh, there was a group, a POSIX group, that was responsible for figuring out what ACLs should be. And it was highly political contentious in that period of time. And so what ended up happening was they got a draft standard, which was sort of 90% of the way, and then before they got a final draft, they got shut down. Uh, there was a, a, for various reasons that I could go into but won't right now, POSIX got cut off, and after a certain date, no new POSIX standards could be released, and they didn't make the deadline. And so all we have for POSIX is this draft standard, and it's missing the last 10%, and so every vendor picks that up and fills in the last 10% their own personal way. And so they're all almost but not quite the same, which is a real pain in the neck. And then the other problem was that the POSIX standards were really standardizing things that were very tied to the Unix view of the world. And it turns out that there's another system out there. It comes from the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And uh, turns out a lot of people use that other system. And they have really a different way of dealing with permissions. And the, the POSIX-style ACLs just do not work and play well at all with the, the Windows type of stuff, <coughs> type of uh, access control list. And so when NFS v4 was being uh, organized, was being created in the IETF, they also, of course, needed to deal with ACLs, and so they came up with a specification, uh, which were referred to as the NFS v4 spec, and that one is designed to work and play well both with Windows and with Unix. And so increasingly today, there's the, 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 the trend has been moving the ACL world towards that interaction. So. Uh, as I say, by design, NFS v4 is designed to work well with Windows and with Unix. Uh, the, the UFS file system implements both the POSIX style and the NFS v4. And you actually, when you mount it, you say, I am mounting this and I want uh, NFS v4 semantics or I want 
POSIX semantics. Now, this isn't something where you can like change your mind back and forth. Well, you can, and, and, and UFS will do its best, but uh, you'll get some pretty bizarre ACLs after a while uh, if you don't sort of pick one and stick with it. Uh, at any rate, uh, it, it will do either one. Uh, ZFS implements only the NFS v4. Uh, the NFS v4 uses what are called inheritable ACLs uh, rather than the default style ACLs used in POSIX. The default ACL in POSIX, uh, essentially you have an AC, uh, what's called a default ACL, which is associated with a directory. And when you create a file in that directory, uh, if you don't specify an ACL, it gets the one that's this default one. Whereas the, the NFS v4 sort of has this sort of notion of this one that's sort of floating and it, it, it works its way down the hierarchy. Uh, it's a similar idea. The, the, really, the, the takeaway from this is you can set up an ACL and say if they don't otherwise specify it, this is what they ought to get. And uh, in terms of the interface, uh, in FreeBSD, we have the same command line tool. So get and set the ACLs, uh, the API to it, the, the utilities to it uh, work the same. And they just, what you get back will look different depending on which one the underlying thing is. But uh, it, it's capable of, of exp, you know, printing them out, for example, for the, the file level command in a way that is comprehensible based on which kind of ACL it is. Okay, so they're there. You, all you have to do is essentially enable them and away you go. All right, moving along, uh, the next sort of idea that came along is this notion of privilege. Now, historically, in Unix, we had the sort of all or nothing. You're either God or you're scum. And if you're root, then you have the privileges of doing pretty much whatever you want, and otherwise, you know, you're locked down and can only do things according to the, the normal user rules. Now, you can expand this a little bit with set GID. Uh, so if with judicious use of groups on particular files and having set GID programs, uh, you can give limited access. So, for example, uh, we have the group operator, and we put uh, disk drives in group operator and give that group read permission on them. And now if you're in the operator group uh, or you run a program, let's say dump, that is set GID, if it were to be set GID operator, uh, would be able to get access to that without having to give away the store. You don't have to be root to do dumps anymore. Uh, but uh, that only works in a fairly limited way. Uh, the root privileges are pervasive through the system. And so some years ago, as part of the security work that uh, Robert Watson and others did, was to go through the operating system and find pretty much every place uh, initially that said, if S user, which is the way of saying, are you root, then we're going to let you do this otherwise not. And pretty much for all of those points, putting in a hook. Uh, and uh, each one of those hooks was given a name. Uh, so, and I, there's uh, the file syscisprivh lists all of them. There are about 200 different privileges that are associated with being root. Uh, I put just a, a, you know, a handful to give you sort of flavor. So priv account uh, says, you know, essentially, can you manage the process accounting? Uh, can you turn it on and off? Uh, max proc, are you allowed to change the maximum number of processes in the system? Are you allowed to configure the dump device? Can you reboot the system? Can you add swap space? Can you take swap space away? That's a different privilege. Uh, are you allowed to look in the kernel's message buffer? Are you allowed to load modules? Are you allowed to delete modules? Are you allowed to adjust the time? Which is different than being able to absolutely set the time because much more evil you can do with setting the time than just adjusting the rate at which it changes. Uh, are you allowed to override writing to files? Are you allowed to override reading files? On and on and on and on. You want a, a good day's read, go look at all those privileges. There's probably things you didn't even dream of that root has as a privilege. Uh, certainly, uh, it's you know, the hacker's guide. You know, if I get root on the machine, what are all the cool things I'm allowed to do? Uh, at any rate, uh, once it's all subdivided this way, then instead of just the generic if s user, now there's a call uh, into this priv check function. And the priv check function gets passed in that, you know, what, what the privilege is that's being asked for, 
and now you can write a module that gets to decide on a privilege by privilege basis whether or not uh, it should be permitted. So uh, you can sort of batch these things together. Uh, so we might want to say, okay, well, we're going to give them sort of networking based privileges or con network configuration, and maybe we'll give them privileges for controlling the filtering. And, you know, maybe we want to let you mount and unmount file systems. Maybe we want to let you export file systems. Uh, you know, what kernel data do we want to let you access, modify? You know, all those many, many things that you saw there. And now for each one of those privileges, POSIX has this notion that we should be able to uh, have the granularity of saying permitted. So are you, it's, are you even allowed to have this at all? Uh, and if we've set saying, you know, you logged in as you are, are not allowed to have this, even if you somehow run a set UID program, we're still not going to let you do it because you, you haven't been permitted it. Uh, is it inheritable? We might say, well, you can have it, but you can't give it away. And this helps a lot with the stack overflow thing. So uh, some shell, for example, uh, you, know, you, you, you might be able to exec, uh, you're running in a set UID program, and you might exec a shell, but we're not going to let you hand that privilege, your root privilege, over to that shell. So sure, they can uh, start a shell, but it just has regular user privileges. Uh, and then there's a little flag you can turn on and off. Uh, so you can say, oh, I want to turn this privilege on. Oh, now, now I don't want to have it. And it, again, it's this sort of, you know, give, take away my special privilege so I don't have to worry about bad things happening. Uh, so you might start up a program and need special privileges to open a file, and then you put them away and let the program do its thing, and then at the very end you get it back again so you can do some final cleanups or whatever. Okay, so there's then the notion that you can implement this uh, by simply coming up with one of these uh, functions that you load into the kernel. Uh, now, the fact of the matter is that although all the hooks are there, this POSIX notion of handing out privilege, that module, although it's been prototyped, has not been put in there. And I asked Robert, you know, well, why is that? And he said, well, there's just too many ways that that could go wrong. And, you know, so that really, someone really has to think about that longer, and I have better things to do with my time, is the implication there, I guess. Um, so, in fact, this, you know, the hooks are there. There are other uh, Mac modules, um, which I'll talk a little bit about, but uh, this particular Mac module isn't yet one that we have there. All right, so this does then get us to mandatory access control. And this is where you can come up with various security policies, such as the one I was describing previously. Um, but when you go through those privileges, you really get very fine-grained control over things. So it's not just what a user can do, but you can also control, for example, when data is being written, you're going to get these calls back into the privilege routines. And so one of the things that the module can do is it can look and it can say, well, you know, let's say we're trying to, to, to deal with sort of military style security. So we've got things that are secret and things that are top secret. And so if a, a, uh, a process running as secret is trying to write data down a pipe to something that's top secret, that's probably okay. But if something that's top secret is trying to write something down a pipe to something that's running as secret, that's, that's potentially leaking information. So we don't want to let that happen. Uh, so, again, because of the granularity of these things, you can have these very tightly uh, defined uh, models. So things like access and use of files and pipes and sockets, and you either are or can, are not allowed to, to add and delete kernel load modules, and, you know, the, the whole long list there. And there are uh, several of these security modules there. So there's a thing called BIBA, B-I-B-A. Uh, which is uh, one of these ones that has this notion of controlling information flow. Uh, there are various and sundry other ones there. And in particular, it allows you to have the kernel not have the policy spread out all through the kernel. In the old days, S user was just sort of sprinkled through the kernel, and you know, that, the policy was effectively sprinkled through the kernel. Now, what's sprinkled through the kernel are all these calls in to the, the priv check routine, and so now you can load a module that gets to set what the policy is, uh, which can just be the generic Unix policy. It can be these sort of military security policies. It can be sort of more commercial data integrity models. Uh, 
And in fact, we could today implement jails through this policy. Uh, it, jails is still got, I mean, in part, it does come through here. In part, there's still some ad hoc, a significant amount of ad hoc code, because this framework wasn't available when jails were being done. If we were to re-implement them today, uh, oh, nearly all of it would come through here, and we would probably come up with a few more hooks to make sure it all came through here. Uh, the hard part is getting all those hooks put in the right place. Uh, it's actually a lot easier to write the, the, uh, the module because now you have in one place a list of privileges and you can sort of look at all those things and decide that they either do or don't meet the policy that you're trying to implement. Okay. So, moving on. Next, we get auditing. And you'd say, oh, but you know, Unix has had you know, accounting forever. But auditing and accounting uh, are not the same thing. Uh, auditing is sort of accounting on steroids, if you will. Uh, it's uh, based on this thing called the, the basic security, open basic security module, uh, which again is, is sort of a, 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 a document that describes sort of what you should be able to uh, control and, and learn uh, based on these records. Uh, and the idea is that when you have these records, we want to be able to find out potentially things about what access control was used. So did they get, were they able to do this particular thing based on the fact that they had root privilege, say, uh, or that they utilized some particular privilege? Uh, what was the authentication that was used to decide that? Uh, and then in, you also have to have sort of over wrappers, uh, security management and audit management to make sure that people can't put bogus records in there, they can't delete stuff, uh, et cetera. And you want to be able to control the volume of the, the audit trail. I mean, at some level, the audit trail is almost like a K-trace. Every single system call can be audited with a great deal of information about that system call. And obviously, if you do too much of that, you are just going to blow things out. So you need to be able to refine what are the things that are important that you, you track and what are the things that you don't care about. Uh, so uh, we have this so-called audit preselection policy where you were sort of deciding, you know, as the record is being built up, is this something that we actually want to keep or not? Uh, you'll then generate the audit records and then after the fact you may keep detailed records for some period of time and then you can run this thing called audit reduce to sort of thin it down for your sort of longer term archive. So you might keep a, a full accounting for a week and then thin it down a bit and keep that for a month and then thin it down even further and keep that for six months or potentially forever uh, depending on what kind of system you're running on. Okay, so we also have this notion of uh, the user credentials uh, which has this so-called audit identifier uh, and this is Again, what is the information that, about the user that needs to be stuck into the record? Is it good enough to just know their UID? Do we want to know what groups they're in? Do we want to know potentially what special privileges they have? Uh, and again, this is a thing that's configurable uh, and will be stuck in. So this, this structure holds things like the terminal and the session and uh, what bits of that should be added. Uh, and then also uh, this sort of pre-selection policy. So when we're just trying to decide whether we even want to generate the record or not, uh, this is sort of thinning at time of creation as opposed to thinning later. So we have this thing called the Audit D daemon, and it's going to manage the collection of the data and uh, the, the, so it's making decisions on the content, you know, what we want to include, what are the records that we want to rate. Uh, also, if things like we're starting to rent out a disk space, uh, so we're, you know, we're not going to have any place to put this, uh, so they can make some decision, maybe it wants to thin it, maybe it wants to offload it somewhere else. But uh, it's, it's sort of the high level policy. It is not having all of these records coming through it, rather what it's going to do is going to start a kernel thread that's going to actually be told how to deal with the distribution. So do we want to store it in the local file system? Do we want to send it across to some other machine? Uh, so for example, this one's compromised. We, ha we know we have records that are good at least up to the point where the compromise occurred. Uh, and uh, sometimes what we want to do is send them to uh, an intrusion detection uh, daemon so that 
you can have in real time something that's just looking at what's going on and it sees something that goes, oh, that doesn't look right. You know, why is, are we suddenly getting this you know, TCP connection to this bizarre port from China? Maybe uh, we should you know, alert somebody about that. Uh, and uh, so, and you, know, you can have multiple of these things going on at once. So here's an unreadable example of an audit record. Uh, so I'll just want to point at the big blobs. There's a header on the thing. There's a set of pieces that make up this particular record, and then a, a trailer that says, all right, that's the end of it, it you, your typical extensible data structure. And so here's uh, a, a typical audit record that's been put up. So uh, it, this, is, this says the, the event here is that uh, we have an open on a read-only file, and this is the path that they're trying to open, uh, and this is this line here uh, is you know, who they are, so it's the UID and all the groups that they're in. Uh, and then finally, what was the result of this system call? In this case, it was successful and it returned file descriptor <coughs> six. Uh, these slides, by the way, I have pushed onto the website. Uh, and I only did it last night because that's when I <coughs> finally finished writing them. And uh, they haven't yet been uploaded, uh, but at some point, uh, Dan's going to upload sort of everybody's slides probably tonight. Uh, and at that point, you can just go to my talk and there'll be a thing. And hopefully there, you'll be able to read this if you actually care. Okay. So the, the last piece that I want to talk about here is capsicum. Uh, and this is sort of the, the latest thing that's just been, you know, it's been in FreeBSD now for several years, but uh, there's been a lot of work going on with it recently to try and sort of refine it to make the, inter the kernel interface sort of more usable and then to actually create some uh, system level utilities that, that make use of it, uh, both because it's a useful thing to have and because uh, it gives you sort of a template should you want to be trying to do the same thing. So the idea of Capsicum is that we want to be able to sandbox uh, processes that we don't entirely trust. Uh, and the idea then is if you have, let's say, something like uh, uh, SSH, then uh, you don't want this, this whole huge glob that's SSH to necessarily run with root privilege because there might be like a big library that you're using to do compression or something. And you don't really want to go audit that whole thing to make sure that there's you know, nothing bad and it doesn't have stack overflows and other things that can cause trouble. So we'd like to take these pieces that uh, don't need any specific privilege or need limited sp special privileges and be able to sandbox them so that they can't do evil stuff. Well, so here on the, the left we have the, the sort of the normal thing where we've got sort of our main loop and it's calling, in this case, a library that does compression. And we haven't audited the compression library and it's huge and you know, so we, we just don't want to have to deal with worrying that it might do something evil to us and so we can drop it into a subprocess here, and then uh, it gets a set of descriptors that we control. So when we, we set it off, we give it a certain set of descriptors, and that's all it gets to work with. So it, it, it has no access to the global namespace. It can't open, you know, it can't open a file by path name. Uh, it can't see other processes. Uh, it can't create new descriptors. Uh, it can't pass descriptors off to somebody else. Uh, it can just use the things that it has. And it can only use them in the way that they were set up. So if they're open for you know, read only, then it's read only. Uh, and uh, so in particular, uh, you, you may need to allow it to do certain constrained things. So you can, for example, give it a descriptor uh, that's open on a directory, and then it can open things relative to that directory. Uh, if you also say that one of the privileges that that descriptor has is the ability to use as the starting point for uh, a, a path name open. So open at, basically. Uh, so by doing this, then, uh, if, if something goes haywire in, the, in that thing, it can't somehow creep back and uh, grab the special privileges that, that the main loop has there. <laughs> So when you actually use Capsicum, uh, you, you, put up, you, you fork a process and get it set up. And then you do cap enter in that process. And that puts it into capability mode. 
And once it's in capability mode, it's not allowed to get out of that. Um, and it can only work with its own file descriptors and has no access to the file namespace. So you open will fail. Open at will work if it has a descriptor open on a directory from which has permission to use that. Uh, so it, it allows you to uh, get really tight uh, bounding on things. And to give you an idea, again, of the granularity of the sorts of capabilities that you can allow it to have or not, uh, you can look in syscapability.h. There's about 60 of them in there. Uh, again, I've just taken a bit of a selection of them here. Uh, so you have, you know, can you read uh, or receive, if it's a network connection, writing and sending? Uh, are you allowed to seek? Are you allowed to set the file flags? Are you allowed to set the, you know, can you do a chadur? Uh, can you change the mode? Can you change the owner? Can, uh, are you allowed to use it as a starting point for a lookup? Are you allowed to do polling? Are you allowed to post events to it? Uh, are you allowed to do accept if it's a, a socket that's a rendezvous socket? Uh, can, can you listen, et cetera? So again, you can just go through. You can give it exactly the set of things that it should need and not anything more than that. And now you can ensure that uh, you know, it's got a very constrained uh, set of things that it can do and very little nasty stuff uh, that it can get away with. Okay, so there you have it from start to finish, 40 years of security, uh, and I'm happy to attempt to answer questions. Yes? Uh, in the auditing, you can't block events from happening per se because I mean, that would be done through one of the other mechanisms, like the privilege mechanism. So uh, you can control what gets reported, but that is not the point where you're trying to make decisions about whether or not you should be allowed to do something. That, that's one of the other mechanisms. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's see. The, in the jails, uh, the, the syscontrol stuff is, um, uh, it's, it's not a blanket, you can't do things. It, it's on a sort of, uh, if you will, variable by variable basis in some sense. So for example, things that are what we call global kernel, so maxproc, which affects the entire system, base system, uh, you can't manipulate that. But there's what we think of as global variables associated with, for example, your networking stack. Uh, and because you have your own virtual networking stack, the global variables, or what you would think of as global variables associated with your network stack, you are allowed to change because you're really only affecting your own network stack. So it, it, it's, not a, it's not like at the top of syscontrol where we just go, no. Uh, it has to go down and it has to be decided in some sense on a variable by variable level. Okay, uh, on the previous one, uh, can you use privilege to override some of the things you otherwise would not be allowed to do with uh, things running in secure level one uh, or sec at some non-zero positive secure level? Uh, in theory, yes. Uh, in practice, some of those things do not, I think have not been put through the priv check uh, routine. So for example, being able to modify uh, a, a, an immutable file. I believe the check that says it's immutable, the answer is no, no matter who you are. I think that happens before the call to priv check. Uh, 
if, if that's the case, then I would say that's sort of a bug in proof check. It should incorporate that, and proof check should be the thing that makes that decision that is immutable or not. Um, but uh, my recollection is that some of those things, some of them, yes, but I think there's some that probably aren't. Uh, I believe by default, when we go multi-user, we set it to minus one, which just says we're not doing that stuff. Yes, the, the comment down here is if you haven't enabled, by default, secure levels are turned off unless you enable it in rc.com. Any more questions? As one, one person put it, uh, you can be absolutely certain that nothing bad will happen to you by turning off your network. Uh, this, however, is usually not a viable solution. Uh, so uh, really, the answer is that you, you, you try and have your system set up in a way where you limit the amount of damage that can happen, and after a fact, you have enough information so that you can know what happened, what they got, and what they did. Uh, and potentially, you know, any Trojan horses or anything else that they may have left behind. And hopefully you figure that out quickly. Uh, the, the point of being able to have a demon that's sort of watching for things, bad things happening and notifying you is to bound that window. Uh, if you go to your management and say, well, yes, these people broke in from China and they had access to the machine for 15 minutes and this is what they got, they aren't going to like that, but they're going to be a lot happier than if you say, well, sometime about six months ago they started breaking into our machine and we're not really sure what they've done or you know, what they may have corrupted. This is not going to go over nearly as well. So uh, all we can really do is try and provide tools to give you good defenses, tools to make sure that you can get the information quick, you, know, you, you, you can quickly identify when things have gone wrong. But, I, you know, you can't, short of turning off the network, avoid this stuff entirely. Okay? Well, it's time is up, so if you have any more questions, feel free to ask me. I'm around for the rest of the conference. Thank you.